Right. Hello, everyone. I'm Bill, Bill Betts from A to Z Animal Care, and this is part four of our A to Z chats. And tonight I'm very uh, happy to introduce Jane Pierman, who is award winning founder and CEO of a UK based charity called Hyperhounds. So, hello, Jane. Hello. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to have a chat with you this evening. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Be good to uh, just to let everyone know that we've we've probably known each other for quite some time now, isn't it? Mm, yeah, quite a few years, I think now, isn't it? Yeah, through the, through our children that went to school together. So you're the founder and CEO of Hyperhounds. Perhaps you can tell our listeners and viewers what what Hyperhounds is and tell us how you got into it. Yeah, Hyperhounds um, is a registered charity that trains up diabetic alert dogs for mainly children that have type 1 diabetes. Um, founded the charity back in 2016 after my own daughter, Sophie, who you know, um, is type 1 diabetic. And we trained a dog up for her and a friend nominated us for Crufts, for the Friends for Life Award. Right. And the publicity that we got from that, we were just absolutely inundated with requests from parents, just like me, that were at the end of the tether had nowhere else to turn and needed an alternative method to support what the clinicians are doing with um, the child's diabetic care to support the family clinically and emotionally. And so the charity started back in 2016 and we've gone from a tiny little one based in Tenterden, helping Kent children. And we're now a national charity yep. <laughs> helping children all over the country. Cool. And I think you've got even Northern Ireland as well, I see on, on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. We've just opened up a hub over in um, Northern Ireland. We're only able to open up hubs where we know that we've got trainers to be able to support the clients. Um, all of our trainers are retired police dog trainers that are specialist in scent detection. So as long as we've got a trainer in an area where there's a need, we can open up a hub. All right, cool. So what made you turn to a dog? What's your dog called? What's the dog's name? Our dog is called Scooby-Doo. Scooby. So what, um, what, Labrador. <laughs> what made you turn to, to Scooby and get our Scooby to help out Sophie? Yeah, it was, it was quite a difficult one, really, because we started researching things for Sophie. We're a, do we're a dog family anyway. Hubby's a dog, uh, police dog trainer. So we've always had police dogs, um, mm. scent detection dogs in the house. And um, I was a police officer myself at the time with links to the police dog training world. And a, a colleague of ours actually suggested that I read a book. It was about a little boy over in America that had a diabetic alert dog. Mm. And unbeknown to my husband, I went and got a dog for Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know anything about this. <laughs> no, no, much to his disgust. <laughs> <laughs> because there's nothing in the UK, certainly not down in the southeast, that will support families, um, especially if they had their own dogs at home. So I set out on a mission thinking, right, I can either wallow in my own sort of exhaustion, if you like, um, being up all the time, uh, being absolutely petrified, because Sophie's got brittle type 1, which means that one minute she'll be chatting quite happily, and the next minute she would collapse without warning because her blood sugars would drop and there'd be nothing I could do to prevent this. Um, yeah. Unlike type 2 diabetes, there's deep in the press when you hear the word diabetes straight away, it's all about diet and lifestyle. Um, we need to change the stigma attached to that, as you know <laughs> as well, because you've got a close link with type 1 diabetes too. It's not that. Yeah, there's two different types. In fact, there's actually more than two types of diabetes. There's many types, but type one, there are over 400,000 people in the UK living with it and 29,000 of those are children. Mm. And there's an increase of 4,000 children a year being diagnosed and it's still in the top five pediatric causes of death in the UK. Right. So I decided, right, okay, I'm gonna do something about this. I'm gonna train a dog for Sophie. And off I went and got Scooby and since we've had Scooby, I mean, he's seven now, Sophie hasn't collapsed once since we've had him. Wow, brilliant. And before then, we were in hospital monthly without warning, you know, draining the NHS resources because there's absolutely nothing anyone could do. But since we've had him, she hasn't had one collapse. Um, he's trained to 
smell when her blood sugars go low and tell us well before it happens. He can beat the um, Libra, the sensor that the people might have seen. Um, Theresa May wears one. It was all in the news last year about funding for children with type 1. He can beat all the technology by about 15 minutes and also he can detect the high blood sugar levels as well which causes the long-term damage for these children. The continual yeah. high blood sugars can then affect their eyes later on as well as possible renal failure. So by detecting it early as an early warning system if you like we're preventing these children from getting these complications later on in life, but also helping them clinically now. Cool. So if, um, if Sophie's, uh, I don't know, in her bedroom and starting to, her blood sugar is starting to go down, what, what behavior do you see from Scooby? What does he do? He'll jump off the bed. He used to alert to her, but when she started going through the typical teenage phase, mm -hmm. she'd be, off, leave me alone. Cause he used to lick to alert her. So he'd lick her arm. Um, he now runs downstairs and gives us a woof. He's actually so cocky, he'll sit in front of the fridge because he knows if he doesn't alert, he tells an adult, he will get cheese. And that is his thing. Right. That is the best thing in the world for him. And he'll sit in front of the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to go and you have to go and give Sophie a nudge to go and do her blood sugars. And yeah. And sort yeah, out. I normally scream upstairs and say, right, what are your bloods? She'll yeah. zap herself and go, yeah, I'm this. And he'll get his cheese. And then I'll run upstairs with the LucasAid. Most of the time she's got the LucasAid upstairs with her anyway, or her insulin kit. She's on a pump so she can just download the right amount of insulin, which she's got to give if her bloods are high. So he's on alert all the time and she's at home or can he go out with her? And Yeah, I mean, he... It's a difficult one because a lot of people think that these dogs can do the night shift for the parents to allow them to sleep. But we have to remember ethically, they're animals, they're dogs. Mm -hmm. They're not nocturnal animals. And with the best will in the world, it would be lovely if Scooby was to be able to do the night shift for me so I could sleep. And a lot of the time he will wake up and tell me that her bloods are going low while she sleeps. But the majority of the time he's here with me or he comes to work with me, he sleeps, chills out, and the minute she comes home from school, he's on alert. So she does a lot of after school activities. He goes off with her doing all of those sort of things, all her sports. All right. Without him, she wouldn't have been able to participate in them anymore. So if he's given her her freedom back and the stigma attached, having a mum going with you all the way, everywhere, nagging you, yeah. it's removed a huge amount of conflict between me and her as a, a parent and a caregiver, if you like. He is now the caregiver. So he's he's really life changing, isn't he? He's changed mm -hmm. you and your family's life massively. But how did you how did you know that? How did you get him to start? How did you start the training? Was it your other half who's a dog trainer, or did you reach out yeah, to other people? Yeah, with the help of the trainers that we've got on board now. Um, they all started helping me. We did scent samples from Sophie, and it was all done with click and reward. It was all done with positive reinforcement training. He smells a smell. He realises he's got to tell mum. It's a bit like the old gun dog retrieval world. They know if they do something right, they're going to get rewarded for it. And the same is the same for scent. Exactly the same theory when you sit on the television, the, the police dogs, when they find the drugs, they get the tennis ball. Exactly the same, but we can't be seen to be lobbing a ball in the middle of the weight rows because the dog has <laughs> So instead we use food rewards. So he gets cheese instead. He gets his cheese, yep. Yeah. Everyone's dogs are different, you know, some like little mini sausages and things. Yeah. But Scooby's thing, that's his thing, he likes cheese. <laughs> and, and so um, how long did you, after you had Scooby and he's doing all these alerts, what, what then made you think, actually, I'm going to go and help other people or I'm going to start a charity or what made you was, sort of go into that? It, it was a bit of a difficult one. I was actually um, winding down from the police. I was uh, medically retired from the police and Crofts happened at roughly the same sort of time. And we started getting inundated with help from people. And I'm not the sort of person that can sit still for too long. And I knew that I would have to do something. I couldn't just you know, stay at home and be medically retired. So it, it all, all happened for a reason. I'm, I'm a big believer in that. Yeah. That one wound down and I started up the other. And obviously um, you're called Hypo Hounds. I know why that name has uh, come about. Perhaps you want to explain to the listeners and viewers why? 
Hypo hounds. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, hounds is because of dogs, but yeah. hypo is um, hypoglycemia, which is when uh, the diabetic blood sugars drop. So we were trying to think of a name that had a, a good little ring to it. And it was, do you know what? Hypo hounds. That sounds quite good. <laughs> we didn't want hyper hounds because when your blood's going high, it's hyperglycemia. And I think they think that we, our dogs would be a bit, woo. <laughs> yeah, like dashing around the place, all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> we have had some people say, you know, is it hippo hounds? And it was like, no, it's not, it's hypo. <laughs> <laughs> Hippo hounds. That's a, a spelling mistake or a typo. Yeah. So you you got on so 2016 you started your charity. And as I said in the introduction, you're you're now an award-winning um charity, an award-winning CEO. What awards have you been have you won in those four years? God, we've won lots of local awards, um, health awards uh for providing alternative health care uh to children. Um, we were finalists with the National Diversity Awards, um, not last year, the year before, which we were really proud of because we wanted to bring a little bit of recognition to children that are fighting battles every day but look fine on the outside. Mm. Um, it, there's a lot of people that say, oh, type 1 diabetes isn't a disability, but it does affect your life daily and it impacts, as you, you well know. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we were kind of bigging up the, the kids for, for that. Um, been, oh, Healthcare providers, we've won um, Startup Charity of the Year Award with ITV, which was amazing. Um, I think it was Sophie on telly for that. Sorry? Sophie and Scooby on telly for that one. Or was no, that no they, they only did the crufts. They did that oh. one. Sophie's now doesn't like being in the limelight anymore. It's somebody else's <laughs> turn. <laughs> but we've done, we've done loads. We've, we've, I'm really proud. Yeah, we never, ever did it for recognition. I, I did it so that no other parent had to go through what I went through. Yeah, and I think the recognition comes afterwards, doesn't it? And it, it goes to show how how valued you are in the, within the community and within the UK now with the work that you're doing. And your personal mission, you've also won personal awards, haven't you? Like entrepreneur awards and stuff like that. So it's, it's hats off to you for that. So the... Um, you're UK wide now. You help children with your with your dogs. How many lives would you say you've you've impacted? How many lives do you think you've changed in the last four years? We've hands on trained forty dogs right. for forty families. So you know potentially that's forty lives that have been altered and impacted upon because of their dogs. Uh, we also have a team of demo dogs as well that go out into the community and do talks. So they are trained as well, um, but they're trained on potted scent so that they can do demonstrations for us. So in theory, we've got 40 dogs that have been impacting on families, um, but there'd be 45 dogs in total. And that's not including the three new ones that we've just yeah. started. Program. <laughs> and uh, people might think, well, 40 dogs, but it's, a, it's not a quick process, is it? When you're trying to get a, a puppy to... to uh, a dog that's trained and ready to go so perhaps you can just talk us through the sort of stages of a, a life of a hypo hound and how they how they come about and the training they receive well we've got two two streams if you like of services that we offer we have the owner based scheme which is what we started out as a charity um, which is where people come to us with their own dog um, they get it to a certain level of obedience training and then we do the scent training and the assistance dog side mm -hmm. Um, but we, we're coming away from that a little bit now. Um, we've recognised that actually these parents have got so much on their plates dealing with these children that they're exhausted. Mm. They can't cope, you know, through no fault of their own with the training commitment and schedules that we have to do for us to be able to have, you know, a certain level of trained dog and the, what we want it to achieve. Um, so... We're wind, although we're keeping the owner based training going, we're winding that down a little bit and we're opening up the new puppy program, which we just started this year, mm -hmm. uh, which is where we train the dogs from puppies and they're placed with foster parents for the first year of their lives, maybe a little bit longer, depending on each dog. Uh, we interview children 
um, the children with the greatest clinical need always gets our help. It doesn't matter what area you're in, it, it goes by clinical need. Okay. Um, and they're assessed by their own clinicians and we go by the data that the clinicians give to us on whether or not they're suitable. So once these dogs have got to a certain level of training with us, they then start their training with the family. So about a year old, um, they'll be passed over to their family to go and live with them. Uh, but they'll be coming to us weekly still for training. So it's not a case of us passing them over and saying, here you go, here's your dog. It's a case of, right, here's your dog. Now you come to us for training with it so that we can train you as a family because they need the training because the dog knows what it's doing. They don't. They don't, yeah. 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 But in the meantime, we've actually got the three children that were chosen for the three puppies on the puppy programme now. They're coming next Friday for their first play date. So we're starting to learn about the puppies' behaviour, what their characteristics are. As we get to know the families and the children, we then get to know what's right family for the right dog and the right temperament for them. Although Steve's already got it up here that he knows what one's going to wear. <laughs> So some of these families, I mean, they might never have had a dog before, but... No, no so we need to guide them. And it's a, it's a whole holistic approach. It's not only the dog, it's also the support services and the mental health clinics. You, they have to be in the right frame of mind and the right place as a family. And when people are first diagnosed, they're desperate for help. Yeah. You look at any alternative you can do to help your child, and we get inundated with requests from families saying, help, I've heard about you. You know, I'm desperate, I'm petrified, I need someone to help me. But you have to wait for that first couple of years, get the honeymoon period over and done with, learn to live and cope with doing the injections, which is, as you know, it's huge and it takes forever. Yeah. And the minute yeah. you've got it under control, something will happen, hormones will start, schools change. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you'll ever ever have it under control once you've got uh, an idea of what you're doing I suppose and I remember sitting down with you in a coffee shop years ago and sort of saying no Tom my son who's diabetic is very interested in a in a hyper hound what's the what the sort what sort of training do you have to go through and after you kind of explained that to me I was just like that is a very big commitment and I'm just not sure whether we could have committed to it and that's the thing a lot of people come into it and go yes i'm gonna do it i do it and for the first six months it's fantastic and then life as it does gets in the way and it's no fault of the parents and a lot of the parents say you know i feel so guilty i can't do this mm. but it's like you know what i'd rather you say that and be honest and say you know i can't do it anymore yeah yeah because they go you have to go up to kennel club gold is it with yeah, your that now because of the covid um we're finding that a lot of our obviously the kennel club classes have all closed at the moment um so our puppies our own puppy the three are going to be doing our own version of the kennel club just so that we know that they're at the standard and uh, get a trainer in to assess them to make sure that the right standards but yeah it's now silver um right. because our assessment of a dog if it was an owner-based dog would be kennel club gold anyway so they'd be working towards that and then that by moving on from Kennel Club Gold, they can then go out and go into shops. They have to then be assessed, don't they, to go into yeah. cinemas yes. and shops and exactly. It's quite you know we have to make sure that they are um, all the dogs have to be neutered or spayed. They have to have inoculations. Just or if they don't have annual injections, we also accept a teeter test. Just purely because the dog is going into places that normal dogs are not allowed for health and hygiene reasons, we have to make sure that they're safe. Mm. And clean. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. the amount of people that say, "Oh, you know, it's fine. I went, I'm going to take it into a shop and say, you can't take it in like that. It's covered in mud. You've got to rub it down first. <laughs> <laughs> so how? So you've had your puppy um, program up and running, and uh, I've got an uh, inside a view of how you select the puppies because we we're we we're lucky enough to have um, two puppies of ours selected for your program. But perhaps you can just let us know how how you go to a litter of puppies and say we want that one and that one how, how does that work can you tell us i pass the buck <laughs> i pass the buck over to steve dean who is absolutely amazing he's our puppy manager and 
he was the um, property manager for the Metropolitan Police for God, years. When I, when I say years, I mean you know, 20 odd years. Yeah. He was in charge of all the selection of the uh, police dogs from breeding, artificial insemination, to actually then selecting the right ones from the litter. So um, when he offered to come on board and help me with the puppy program, I scooped him up <laughs> with open <laughs> arms <laughs> of his wealth of knowledge and experience. But he actually does a thing very similar to the Volhart score, which is a temperament test on the puppies. And I've actually got some notes because he wrote them down, so I'll make sure I get them right. right. <laughs> okay. I knew I'd forget. He said that it's a specifically adapted test Right. Um, his own version of the Volhart score, obviously for every dog that is doing a job, you need it to be quite area specific. Mm. So police dog scent work is going to be different temperament to what we need. There you're going to need your high drive dogs. Here we're going to need fairly low drive. Um, yeah, dogs that sort of chill out for a bit and then... Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, we don't want like a... A nutty dog going around the house because the parents are going to be like oh my goodness me <laughs> <laughs> we want something with an off switch but we want something that's confident um in itself in any environment they're tested at seven weeks old and a lot of people say well, why do you test at seven weeks and it's because the brain has formed to give a cognitive response at dead on seven weeks and um, as you know he takes them out of the litter so each puppy is tested individually and the reason why that's done is as a litter they are all big and brave they're all playing rough and tumble and you might get your little subservient one at the end but when one starts they all pile in and join in when you take them away from their little safety nets and put them on their own that's when you get to see what they're truly going to be like and at seven weeks that is when that brain function starts to kick in and that's when we do it from there so i remember um i watched him with our litter and he sort of um approached them with like a strange teddy bear to see what they did whether they sort of growled at it or played with it or just accepted it and i think they he turned them upside down on their back to see how long they'd last for to see how tolerant they were didn't he yeah them out of their comfort zone i think yeah. it, it is and introduce them to things that they've never seen before and how they'd react on their own. Yeah, it was quite um, interesting to watch because we had seven puppies and you could see from the tests that he was doing, you could see that we'd be like, yeah, that one probably will pass, but that one, that one's not interested whatsoever. And um, so you couldn't just take a whole litter from a, a dog and say, right, we're going to train you all as hyperhounds. It's, it's very specific yeah. things that you're That's looking for, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think that did he bring the scent with him as well to test mm. the dog's noses? Some of them, you know, even though they're dogs and you, we all know how brilliant a dog's nose is, some of them just aren't interested and some of them are so busy they want to get in there and. Mm. Yeah, you could definitely see he'd have a, a scent pot and then they'd smell it. <clears throat> then he'd put a pot over that and see whether it carried on. And some were like, no, I can't bother now. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be the dog that he really wouldn't want because. They'd smell the smell and then roll over and go back to sleep again without telling a mum or dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. So it was very interesting um, to watch him do his work. So then Simba and Nala and Poppy are all part of your programme. They're out with puppy walkers. How do you find your, your, your volunteers, your um, foster parents? Is that just advertised or? Yeah, we literally just do Facebook campaigns. Um, we're part of the Kent Volunteering Bureau. So we put a post out saying, look, this is what we want to do and this is what we need. Can you devote time? Have you got a secure garden? Is someone at home all the time? And more importantly, oh, would you be able to give it up after a year? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you spend a lot of time with the puppy. Yeah, and you know, I, hats off to them. I couldn't do it. I would fall in love and I wouldn't be able to give the dog back. But one of our um, our foster parents is, were actually gaining a lot of experience from them because they used to be guide dog walkers and had 16 dogs with them. Yeah. So we're actually sort of nurturing their experiences and their knowledge and what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong and how we can improve for the next round for next year. And so do they get involved in the training? Do you, do you ask them to do training with the pups at home or is it just when they come and see you? No, they um, Steve goes to see them weekly, so they get a weekly one-to-one. -one. Right. 
Um, so they get one-to-one -one session and then once a month we all meet up with all of the puppies. Since the word go, we've all been in a bubble. So we've all been able to go and carry on doing our training. So the dogs haven't been hindered at all with their training from that sort of perspective. But yeah, once a month we all meet up together and then we do like a mass training day yeah. together in a group. And it's nice because then we can see how different breeds are improving, whether the bitches are better whether the boys are better, sometimes one's better than the other. And the next meeting we'll see, oh, actually, that one's now taken over. And is this just normal normal training, like sit, lay down, stay, or is it yeah. progressive? At the moment, all we're doing is introducing them to as many experiences positively as we possibly can. So we're just doing the very basics. Like I said, we're doing the Kennel Club puppy tests at the moment. So it's the basic sit. We're not putting pressure on them. We just want life to be fun at the moment and for them to experience everything in a positive environment from trains, sitting at head call, watching airplanes going by, <laughs> meeting horses, going to see cows, go, <laughs> you name it, they've got to do it. <laughs> and do, you, do you decide what, um, what their specialist treat's going to be at this stage or is that to come? At the moment, then, well, your two that you've got, um, they're... They're not really that fussed at the moment, but I don't know whether that's because they're Labradors. <laughs> yeah, they <don't> anything. <laughs> Give them a shoe. <laughs> yeah. that. Poppy's very ball orientated. That's because she's a spaniel. So she's, yeah. she's very, everything, tennis ball, tennis ball, tennis ball. But yeah, slowly, when we start doing the scent work, that's when we're introduced to treats because then we want them to realise smell, treat. Yeah. So how does that work? How do you get... Um, a scent from a child who's diabetic and then get the dog to recognize the scent? We take swabs from the child. Um, we take samples of their breath from their skin when they're going low. Um, the clinical trials that were done in America showed that there's a chemical called isoprene in your breath that's concentrated by 50% when someone with, has got hypoglycemia. Right, low blood so, sugar. Yeah, so we know that the high bloods smell of pear drops but the dogs can obviously pick that up way before we can and the lows obviously it's got a scent as well so we take the samples of the, the um, child scent and we pot them and at our office we've got a, a clinical area as you know that's um, purely got scent stands on so we do it through positive reinforcement training they've got the scent stands the pot, the pot is put in the stand they smell the pot they get the reward and it's built up gradually and gradually. And then we take it from the pot to the child, to the child, to their home. Right. And once we know they're doing it at the home, we then go out and about. So it, even now, I will do training with Scooby hmm. just to throw him out sometimes. Because I think, okay, so if he's gone out for the day, maybe, and she's at the age now where she's got a boyfriend, she doesn't want him tagging along all the time. So I think, right, okay. I'll get a scent pot, I'll put it in my pocket and see what he does, just to keep him ticking over. Right. And in the most weird environment as well, I'll, you know, I'll put one in the bathroom and hide it behind the loo. It where it's a high it. environment, but he's got to learn, actually, I can smell it, mum. I don't care where it's coming from, I can smell it. Yeah. I've got visions of people sort of breathing into a pot. Is that how you do it? Or is it a, a, a mouth swab? Ah, that would be giving away. That would be giving oh, away. Okay. Yeah, we can't give too much away, but yeah, it's something similar to that, yes. Right, okay. I didn't realise that was an industry secret. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, give okay. that secrets away. But yeah, right. it's something similar to that. It, the actual smell comes from, you know, some people say, oh, I, they spit into a pot. Hmm. But it's not saliva. It comes through your skin. It comes through your pores. Right. It, when you get low, you, Tom and Emma probably get clammy. You yeah. sweat. It gets yeah. on your clothes. You you ooze if you like <laughs> a scent. And um, when you're not having a hypo, you've got your normal smell that your dog knows, and then a hypo or a hyper becomes abnormal. So the dog knows that when they smell that, that's when there's trouble. I see. Yeah. And I think you touched on it. It's like it's not a well, you've done two years now, you're fully trained, you can go out. It's a continual training so you must be asking the families to carry on that training within the home environment and then you just do refresher training and yes yeah we do we we touch we have to do an annual license so every year the dogs are licensed to make sure that they're still doing it uh, to 
95%. So we want the dogs alerted to 95%. If they go anything below that, um, we know that we've got to do some top up scent training and we would never set a client up to fail. So we have a, a fantastic app that's linked to the CGM so that when the dog alerts, they can do it on their phone to keep a log. We yeah. can keep a track of that at the office. And then three months before the license is due, we have a look, make sure everything's okay. Think, okay, yeah, they're fine. They don't need any more top up training for that. We can license them. And then you get dogs that actually might need a little bit of tweaking. We pull them in, do that tweaking, then license them. Yeah. But it's all about support. You know, it's not like I said before, it's not about the dog training. We've got um, psychologists on board now. We've got counsellors on board that are doing one-to-one -one and also group therapy sessions because it is a bit of a bereavement when you have uh, a child that gets diagnosed with type 1 because you you want back the child that was carefree yeah. and didn't have to do all the things they now have to do. So it's important for the parents to be able to get that out of the system. So yeah, that's yeah. why we've got new services. Yeah, it's, it's, it's life changing. And I think you hit on it earlier when you said you didn't want to be always going around with Sophie. I, mm -hmm. I've had it with Tom, but I think with some positive experiences with Tom, where Tom's diabetic and I've taken him to beavers and cubs, I've then got involved with stuff like that myself. So I've had to sort of join in and then become a cub or beaver leader. So it does, there are some positives with it. It does sort of broaden your horizons a bit, but it is life changing, um, mm -hmm. as you know. It is. It is a um, completely different way of life. <laughs> Your support <laughs> network changes as well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, constant. Yeah, <laughs> it's exhausting. People yeah. don't understand how exhausting it actually is. And you know, you've got Emma as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably lucky though. I'm probably lucky that Emma was very, very experienced at being a type one herself. So that probably helped us. I feel, um, I feel really sorry for the families that have no type 1 diabetes in within their family so they go to hospital and you you're probably in hospital for what, two to three weeks and then you're just let free <laughs> go and make some life-changing decisions for your child and uh, we'll catch up with you in a week's time to see how you're doing and you are you're kind of left alone and that's when we suddenly get an influx and we actually get people when they're in hospital i my child is in hospital right now i'm googling everything i can yeah. because they've got time to you know, to help support them when they get home because you are you you do need that space you do need to learn to deal with it on your own but at the same point you need someone to keep you up a bit as well and you, talk about, you talked about the honeymoon period earlier what's what explain what the honeymoon period is for diabetes i can only obviously go by my experience because obviously every diabetic is different everyone you know, their insulin regimes are different, but um, the honeymoon period, from my understanding, is a settling in period of getting used to making sure your ratios of insulin for when you eat, um, for the viewers that don't understand what I'm talking about, every time a type 1 diabetic child eats something, they have to test their bloods and they have to work out how many carbohydrates they've eaten and then become a mathematician <laughs> overnight correctly dose the right amount of insulin to counteract what they've just eaten and that is petrifying <laughs> when you're first told that if you make a mistake your child could go into a coma it is petrifying um, but you do you become an overnight mathematician and i failed maths at gcse level <laughs> but i'm actually quite good at it now <laughs> but yeah the honeymoon period is all about settling in um, learning to live with diabetes coming to terms with it going on uh there's some courses that the nhs and the diabetic specialist teams give you on learning to recognize when your blood sugars go low and that honeymoon period you're actually really well supported by your team sometimes remotely you know you can pick up the phone yeah. even though you feel on your own you, you you've got a phone they're just a phone call away um so when that honeymoon period and your blood's just, they get the ratios right, you come out of the honeymoon period, but then something else starts. And that would probably be puberty or like we said before, <laughs> stress. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> or maybe you might get stressed as a parent and you think, I can't deal with it anymore. Um, I've been there. You, you can have a complete meltdown and say, actually, I can't, I can't be dealing with this anymore. Mm. I can't yeah, cope. Yeah. And it's not a weakness, but then you need to put your hands up and say, 
you know, look, I'm not coping very well right now, which is why we're offering something a little bit more than just dog trauma, trying to almost like a holistic approach to the whole family, because if the family can't deal with it, we can't help them. <laughs> And did you find Scooby helped you to deal with it as well? Because not only is he uh, helping Sophie, he's also a companion, isn't he? He's a pet. Yeah. Pets are always useful for taking on walks and chilling out. And Exactly. exactly. You, you can become a little bit of a, a recluse um, you know, at that particular time when Sophie was diagnosed. I was going through medical retirement. I wasn't getting out much. But having the dog, people stop and talk to you. Um, it gives you something to do and it gives you something positive to focus on. And it also gives, if you do the owner based training, you're doing something constructive and you yeah. feel like you're doing something for your child that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise, if that makes sense. Yeah. I always found um, when Tom was first diagnosed that all the issues I ever came across were always at sort of half past five on a Friday night or in the weekend when the diabetes team were closed, unfortunately, but we, met, we got through them all. So he's doing well now. You said about um, it's a holistic approach and it's an alternative sort of, I wouldn't say it's alternative medicine, but it's a, an alternative, um, what the word it's is for it? It complements everything. Yeah. Every, it runs alongside because there's no cure for type one. We don't know what causes it. So there's no cure. So all we can do at the moment is go by what the clinicians give us and do something a little bit extra to boost it along. So, and what did what do the NHS think about hyperhounds? Do, are they supportive? Are they a bit standoffish? I mean, sometimes the medical profession are very sort of yeah. this is how we do it. How did they, how did you get on with them? To start off with, um, the actual clinician was very anti. No is very scientifically based, you know, no, 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 there's no proof this happened, this works. The nurses were like, bring it on, you know, <laughs> fantastic, um, which was good. But then when the hospital admission stopped, mm. when the ratios weren't being corrected anymore, but they could, it was before the days of the Libra, um, the scanner, and yeah. Sophie was getting to the point where she didn't want to test her fingers anymore because they, they were full of calluses and they were sore, but they, all of a sudden could see, hang on a minute, she's testing her blood more. Why is this? You know, she's not having hypos anymore. She's not having these twos anymore. Why is she testing her blood at 4.5 consistently? Mm, Why is she testing her at five? Because the dog's telling us. That's when it suddenly goes, ka-ching, okay. And that's when we started getting some really positive feedback from not just Sophie, but from the other children, um, clinicians that are actually now putting them actually putting pen to paper now on the children's notes saying that they're actually now at low risk of long-term health complications so wow. you know, although we haven't got any nhs funding or anything like that you know that that would be you know that would be a dream come true to be able to get something like that it in reality you know we have we'd have to do clinical trials which cost hundreds of thousands of pounds and i would rather be ethical and spend the money on the kids yeah and i think i think if we're realistic here you know like you're saying earlier diabetes is something you have to deal with now but the cost to the, the health service and the the issues that you get from diabetes is a long way in the future so by sourcing things out now and helping the children out now you're actually saving the nhs and the, our country a lot of money in the future aren't you yeah I mean, I did a, a talk, uh, it was not last year, the year before, at um, a medical society. And there was a, a professor there that was sitting down and he, you could see the cogs ticking. And he said, right, so if every child had this amount of uh, admissions, just roughly, he said, I would put you down at about four million pounds you've saved the NHS. <laughs> and it was, really? And he said, well, if you think about, you get the initial 999 call, you get your paramedic call out. You get your ambulance, you then get a full triage team of intensive care in a paediatric bed waiting for you. You've then got three or four days in a high intensive care unit. You know, that costs thousands. Yeah. And for that to be monthly, you know, over, you know, if you look at Sophie as a prime example, over a seven year period who hasn't had any, the proof's in the pudding. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, it's right that we do acknowledge that, you know, your, the work that you've done and you're doing, it is hard work, isn't it? It's hard work running, running this charity because, and unfortunately, it does come down to money. So 
how how do you access funds for hyperhounds? How what, what do you do to rate? How much does a hyperhound cost? Everything's different. The owner-based training, obviously, we don't have to support the food, the insurance, and the daily living of the dog. So for a hyperhound, for someone coming to us for training, it would cost about a minimum of twelve thousand pounds to train. That includes obviously the support costs all the way through the life of the dog. So we're not talking about a one-off cost for training the dog. We're talking about maybe a, a 12 year cost over a period of time of specialist training, specialist counselors. For uh, the puppies on the puppy program, again, it's something a little bit different. Um, everyone goes, oh my goodness, it costs a lot of money. Yes, it does. It's a minimum of 25,000 oh. pounds which is a lot of money. When you look at the guide dogs and you look at the costings from them, which is about 50,000 pounds, actually, you know, it, it is a lot lower, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we don't have the overheads that they do. <laughs> Not yet, how, anyway. <laughs> how, do you, uh, how do you go out and get this money? How do you raise this money? It's, uh, God, it's hard work. Um, we get no government funding. It's all done purely on fundraising efforts from the families, from the staff, from the volunteers. We're just branching out into the corporate world. We are very lucky to have the support of Unitrust Protection Services that have opened up the corporate world in London to us and have opened up so many doors. Um, we've also got our first legacy, um, which is such a lovely gift uh, for the gentleman to give us. Um, who sadly passed away so he's funded uh, a dog for a child and also moving forward also a training and reception area so that families can actually come and receive the training in a, a far more covid friendly environment because yeah. the offices we've currently got are so small that we have had to close them to clients but i'm literally knocking walls down <laughs> i have <laughs> today <laughs> So that our premises will be a little bit bigger. And is so, that from yeah. the, the money, the, the, the donation you received in this gentleman's will? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, which is lovely. But hmm. yeah, corporate funding, we're doing sponsor the dogs. Um, so people can sign up to a monthly direct debit and get quarterly pup dates on the dogs and what they're getting up to. Um, corporates can also sponsor them. And if the corporate firm actually sponsors a dog for us, hmm. they actually get to name the dog too. Right. Um, what we're finding is a lot of the, especially like the big companies up in London, they want the puppies up in London. They want them in the offices because it's improving the mental well-being of their staff. Yeah. The downtime, which then produces productivity in their business. So it's a winner winner, especially for these big firms. You know, twenty five thousand pounds for a big multi million pound firm is is their tea club really? Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh... You're talking about COVID there. Has it been a tough year with COVID? Have you been able to do as much fundraising or has it all been restricted? It's been it's been really hard for us. Um, we've had to pull on our reserves. Uh, we really do rely on the families to do the fundraising and we do all the big events like Crufts. We do Paws in the Park. We, we, we raise a lot of money at that, those events and also awareness for community groups that then fundraise for us. Yeah. And we've had every single event this year has been cancelled. So our income stream has been extremely low. So we've, we're literally robbing Peter to pay Paul at the moment, knowing that you know there will be a light at the end of the tunnel eventually. But we've just got to keep ticking along in the meantime. So 2021 is going to be the, hopefully, touch wood, get going again with the old fundraising. And yeah. people do... Can people do like London Marathon in, in yeah. your your name and yeah of course yeah I mean we've, we've got we get tickets for things that we can do like tough mudders you know we always you know abseils you know sky diving you know if there's anyone out there that wants to throw themselves out of an aeroplane <laughs> <laughs> big respect to you <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah anything like that you know is you know we get lots of events like that and we're always putting it on our twitter feed and on our facebook and instagram when we get um opportunities for things like that we've got the um i think there's the asics um 10k that was put off to yeah. next year um we don't tend to get any spaces for the london marathon purely because you have to buy the tickets in bulk and we can't afford to 
do it. Yeah. Um, unless someone bids for us and says, you know, I'll run it independently and, and we're. Okay. So, and there's lots of little things uh, like it must be like just giving pages. And if yeah. you buy from certain mer from certain, certain merchants, you can get money donated to you. Is that right? Yeah. Um, uh, give as you living, I think it's called um, eBay. Um, you can click if you sell things, you can click what as one of your recipients. I know that at the moment they're doing the for every pound you donate from eBay, eBay will uh, donate five pounds. All right. Very nice huge but yeah give, give as you living recycling stamps recycling mobile phones you know, silly little things you know, schools yeah you know, that's a big thing for a school involved you know, we'll go to schools we'll happily take the puppies along show mm -hmm. the videos and we've got a book that, that we do for children's book week that we take along that the kiddies can buy but you know dress like a dog day yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you wrote you wrote the book didn't you I did, yes, yeah, Scooby Sniffing Adventures. <laughs> so I've put you as a published author as well. As a published right? author as well, yes. Oh, the titles. <laughs> do you sell the book as part of your... Yes, we do, yes, for £2.50, so it's a really expensive, beautiful book. <laughs> the Audible? <laughs> and I have one right here. <laughs> <laughs> so if people can't um, donate for whatever reason, are they able to help in other ways? Yeah, we are. For next year we are wanting to hit in the ground running so volunteering we've got loads of different volunteering opportunities from coming to help us at the office maybe you've got office-based skills that maybe you're retired and you think actually i'd like to donate an hour or two here or there a week come and help us in the office we are searching for puppy parents for next year so if you're interested in becoming a foster parent let us know also for events, we like these big corporate events that we do. We do crafts, like I say, we do um, the London Excel, Discover Dogs, Paws in the Park, Man the Stand. You know, we, when we do Paws in the Park, we have a big bubble pit pool that hmm. we fill with balls and water and we put liver paste in one of the balls and people pay two pounds for a minute for their dog to cool off, which is fantastic because most of the time it's absolutely boiling hot. Yeah. Dog finds the ball with a smell inside it. They win a, a goodie bag of food, and it's, a, it's, a, it's we have a real good laugh when we do events like this. It's hard work, but yeah, we need volunteers for next year so we can hit the ground running. So it's open to anything, like office skills through to everything we need. Yeah, skills, anything. fundraising skills, anything, anything. Yeah. You need. and you need some puppies as well, I believe, for next year. Yes, as well. If there's any breeders out there, we're after. I think Labradors for next year. Yeah, for the next class. So we're after six Labradors for next year. Wow. That's so that we can help six families. So we'll grow and grow and grow at a strategic pace. So. And how do you decide that? Are you just from what you can manage, or are you just looking at? Yeah, obviously it'll be down to it'll be down to finances. But we were really fortunate just before um, the COVID came in that we had, were chosen as part of the Lord Lieutenant of Kent's uh, Kent Charity Mentoring Scheme where we were given a one-to-one -one by a business advisor to help us do a business plan for the next five years. Mm. And uh, the lady there, Marion, who's actually become a real firm friend now, has uh, helped where I would say, I wanted to do baby steps. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Gross me you. Gross. <laughs> Push you forward. Yeah. And, and she's right. You know, you, you don't get anywhere from sitting on your backside twiddling your thumbs. If we want to help more people, we've got to get out there. And to do that, we've got to get bigger. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Well, it's been fantastic to speak to you, and I've learned a lot, and I'm sure everyone else has learned a lot. How can people get hold of you? What uh, you got website and Facebook? and? Yeah, if you just type in Hypo Hounds into your search engine, we'll come straight up to the first one now. Um, yeah, we're on Facebook at Hypo Hounds, Instagram, Hypo Hounds, Twitter, Hypo Hounds One, um, all the email, everything's on the website. If you want to help or want to get involved, please get involved. If you've got a business that you want to have a charity tin, some leaflets in your business, let me know and I can drop it off to you. It's not a problem. Brilliant, brilliant. So hopefully you'll, uh, you'll get a few extra pennies and some help from people watching this video. It'd be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, it'd be lovely because every penny will help another child. So that's what it's all about. Yeah, and if you do, perhaps you can let us know and we'll obviously put it on our, on our Facebook page and stuff as well. Definitely.
Well, it's been lovely to talk to you and uh, hope you have a good evening. And you, thank you so much for this lovely chat. It's been lovely. <laughs> All right, we'll catch up soon. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>